Alright, if you made it this far, thanks for sticking it out. We're gonna get to the S tier with our two remaining characters. If you just clicked over here to see what this is, more power to you. If you just want to see the results without the explanation, that's fine. I dig it, I get it, I understand, I've done it. But the S tier criteria is pretty simple. These are two characters that function in any rank, in any situation, in any area. They don't care. They just work wherever they are. The team doesn't have to be built around them. They don't have any required synergies. They don't have any inherent weaknesses. They may actually be overstatted. And in the case of the Highwayman, some of his trinkets are just absurdly busted. And they have good camp skills to boot. And so at the bottom of the S tier is actually the Crusader. Which means that this is the best character in the game, but we'll get to that in a minute. So the Crusader is pretty ridiculous. 61 HP, that's second to the Leper at who has 63. 25 dodge is okay, lowest speed in the game I think at 3. 10 to 19 damage, pretty strong, definitely a bruiser type. But overall just a very tanky character, very tough to bring him down. It takes a lot, it takes some focus fire from the enemies, it takes one or two crits and then it'll be at like 20 hit points. And he's still really not in danger. In between his solid damage, he has a bunch of support skills that just do a lot of things that help out the team, specifically his supplemental healing. He's very good in a prolonged battle because of the way Bulwark of Faith works now. And I think his Holy Lance change actually put him over the top. We'll talk about that when we get to it. His baseline attack of Smite doesn't have any damage bonuses, just hits the first two ranks. Has bonus against Unholy, which not the best enemy type, you don't run into it too much, but he doesn't really need to be fighting Unholy to be good. His 10 to 19 serves him just fine, that's Hellion damage, Hellion does some pretty good damage. He's not a crit monster, so a lot of his moves don't have crit, except Holy Lance. So Smite, just solid, always have it on, just slap things whenever you need to. Zealous Accusation, I call it the scriptures. Easily his worst attack. Minus 40% instead of 50 is okay for a cleave, but still just bad. I'd rather hew in just about every applicable scenario. And I'm actually surprised this doesn't have bonus damage to Unholy. And even though he has one really bad move, all the rest of his moves are great. So you'll never use Zealous Accusation. Stunning Blow and only half damage penalty, really good. Average stun base at the 100% that goes up to I think 150. Solid. The fact that it's only minus 50% is pretty good. His base damage is high, as we were saying, 10 to 19, so you can just clock someone for like 10 damage. And also has a slightly higher base accuracy than Smite, so it's pretty common to, I feel, use Stunning Blow to clean up kills when they have like 5 HP and you don't want to risk missing or something like that, you just hit him with the stun. Bulwark of Faith, this used to be something you had to refresh per turn which made it not that good. Now that you can only use it once a battle, that's actually great because if you're fighting any battle that you expect to go past like turn five, you can just turn that on like a long boss battle and just have giant prot, there you go, you're good. Marking yourself can be a detriment. So if you really want to get around it, you could have an Arbalest that can clear it or otherwise just let him tank like you're expecting him to since he's marked. Just be careful, you don't want to use it against things that get bonus damage against marked targets. Battle heal can be used in any rank. A really good spot heal if you're in a pinch. My normal loadout is usually Smite, Battle Heal, Holy Lance, and the uh, Inspiring Cry or whatever. I feel that covers a lot of bases, and Battle Heal is actually decent enough to where if you give him a healing trinket or two, the Crusader can function as your team's solo healer. You just drop him in rank 3 and he's just this really tough Vestal basically without a group heal. You just hit Battle Heal every turn for, you know, plus 10 or whatever, it's actually pretty good. And the fact he can use it from all four ranks just makes it better. So wherever he's at, he always has access to something that can help the team if need be. The Holy Lance change is the one that pushed him into S tier, I think. Holy Lance used to only hit the last two ranks, so 3 and 4. And then I think it got buffed to where it can hit rank 2, and that just made it way better. It's so consistent now. You don't have to like try and use it to snipe someone in the back line. You can actually use it to fix positioning or something if you find yourself in that situation. And there's a pretty funny but actually effective strategy for Holy Lance where you have two Crusaders. The one in the third rank has higher speed than the one in the second rank, so like you put a bracer on the rank 2 Crusader or whatever. And they can just alternate using Holy Lance from rank 3 because they keep switching places with each other and just keep stabbing everyone in rank 4, 3, and 2. It's surprisingly effective, especially with the bonus crit. I think it's his only attack that has bonus crit. And it's also considered a melee attack, so all the good trinkets that buff his other attacks buff it as well. So between Holy Lance, Battle Heal, and Inspiring Cry, he has a lot of things that he can do if he gets thrown out of position. Whereas the Leper, if the Leper gets thrown to rank 3 or 4, the Leper's usually screwed until someone fixes it, or helps him fix it, or he fixes it himself by moving forward slowly. The beauty of the Crusader is you have this almost unkillable frontliner who can just sit up there smiting and stunning and healing if need be, that can also drop a bunch of support skills or big damage if he gets thrown in the back. Like, he has no weakness in positioning. There's no bad spot for this character ever. You can almost use a one-size-fits-all build, and it just works. You know, in the immortal words of King Crimson, 
it's just always good. He doesn't need to be fighting Unholy to be good, that's the other thing. His niche is the Unholy, but even outside of the runes, he does great damage, incredibly tanky, good in all spots, inspiring cry, really good stress healer. The fact that it heals on top of that, just heals flat HP is really good too. So the Crusader's moveset just mixes solid damage output with ridiculous survivability on top of a lot of supportability and healing and stuff like that. And the good part is he only has like a core two or three moves that you really need, like Smite, and I would say maybe Holy Lance if you really wanted to, and then Inspiring Cry. And then you can just pull whatever for move four and your Crusader will always be effective. He has some really good camp skills, you can cure mortality debuffs, it's all stress management. Minus 25% stress for 2 points, really good, way better than pep talk at it's minus 10 or 15 or whatever it is. Zealous speech, the only 5 point camping skill in the game, but it is in fact a great one. Take 15 stress off everyone, and then also give them minus percentage stress for the rest of the, or for 4 battles, really good. And then in a pinch, if you really need it, he has a nighttime ambush preventer, which is still solid because he can lower his own stress, so surprisingly good stress healer it's weird you don't think of him as a stress healer right he has the ability to heal hit points he can do some good damage he's a tank his stress healing is probably his second biggest facet it might be his most underrated quality i don't know because whenever i look at the crusader i'm going okay bruiser hits hard doesn't die actually has a bunch of stress healing his vanilla trinkets are okay both of his well i shouldn't say both the defender seals not that good five prot for three crit not a great trade Knight's Crest, 10% HP, pretty good, sign me up, especially at a common trinket. Swordsman's Crest, pretty good early, just 10% damage, really nice. Paralyzing Crest, the bonus stun for basically no penalty, like minus two dodges, whatever. Pretty good at all levels. Commander's Orders really opens up his ability to heal, so if you want to go solo Crusader healing, or if you just want him to be like that kind of healer supplemental role, you're going to be using this. You can put this and then one other healing trinket on him, like a Ancestor Scroll or whatever. And then he has some respectable single target healing numbers. I would probably use it over the Occultist for single healing. And then we have this other situation where the orange level trinket is probably... It's not the worst one. The Defender Seal is the worst one, but the Holy Order is not that good. You trade some resists, which are very helpful, for Death Blow Resist, which is pretty good, but he's usually the last one to die. The minus 20 stress doesn't really matter that much considering he has a bunch of stress healing but it's still okay. And then you have this tug of war going on where you have minus stress but then plus virtue chance. Which I don't understand why they do that because if you have a bonus to virtue you kind of want to get stress so you don't want to be healing stress. Like this item just clashes with itself. It's giving you virtue but lowering stress. It's giving you death blow but making it easier to die because you take minus resist to damage over time effects. And I'm not saying every trinket has to have just all winning stats and be super optimized, but this thing's all over the place, which is why I don't like it. I like his Crimson Court set a lot. It really solidifies his tanking role, makes him pretty hard to move from wherever he's at, gives him a lot of defenses, gives him a bonus to all his healing and stress healing abilities, and then on top of his bonus prot, he gets 20% HP, which really helps scale it if you can understand like the mathematics. But prot gets better the more hit points you have, so giving him a bonus 20% HP on top of his already ridiculous HP is pretty good. And the only trade-off for this whole set is minus two speed, and he's already the slowest character in the game, so who cares? The Shard Hilt is pretty good. You get more tankiness, you get some bonus stun and all that, extra damage in the form of Blight if it actually lands. At the weird detriment of being able to randomly target a character, which isn't too bad. It's only a pain in the ass when you're trying to finish something off and it specifically does it, but that's, that's only a 5% chance to happen. So it's pretty rare that this screws you, but it gives you a bunch of stuff in return for that, so I think it's actually really good. 200 Shard cost means the devs also thought this was a pretty good item. Overall, the Crusader is this really good bruiser, a mix of solid damage, ridiculous survivability, respectable healing and stress healing, great camp skills, and a very versatile character that can almost use the same moveset and it just depends where he lands, if there's a surprise or something like that. So the couple buffs he did get, like Holy Lance, really did put him over the top, and maybe that's what was supposed to happen. Because when you start the game, you get a Crusader and a Highwayman, so maybe Red Hook was trying to purposely make those two characters really good. Either way, Crusader is always one of those classes where when I don't have one, or if I'm starting a new playthrough and I only have one or two on deck, and I can't use either of them, I actually feel bad. Plus, I love the whole aesthetic of the Templar and Deus Volts and all that, so I really like Crusaders and Paladins and that kind of thing. Which just adds to the flavor and my love of this class. Alright, it's time to crown our champion, the Highwayman. The best character. There's a lot to talk about. For this character and why it's so absurd that it even exists in this iteration. As we've been doing, we're just going to start with his fantastic stats. 30 dodge, pretty good. 
43 HP, very respectable, more than enough. 7 speed, still pretty good. He gets speed from a lot of other sources, that's why it's okay that it's 7. 9% base crit, really good. 9 to 16 damage, that's higher than everyone that is not your actual bruiser frontliner types, like the Hellion and the Leopard and the Crusader. For some reason, he's 9 to 16 when the Bounty Hunter, I believe, is 8 to 16, so they just gave the Highwayman an extra damage. He's very mobile with his base movement of two forwards and two backwards. He can get wherever he wants to at any time. And then not only are his moves incredible, a lot of his trinkets are also absurd. I start at the top of the list with Wicked Slice. I don't understand the thinking behind this. For some reason, it just has a bonus 15% damage on top of what it normally has. It has a 5 crit modifier, which is pretty good. So where most characters have either a conditional damage bonus, such as the Grave Robber, the Crusader, who have to hit something that's like a affected by Blight or Unholy, Wicked Slice is just plus 15% damage at all times. Here you go, have fun, hell yeah. Pistol Shot can use it from almost any spot to hit almost any spot. Minus 15% damage, small penalty. Giant crit modifier, there it is. Bonus damage against Marked? Sure, have that too. I'm the highway man, I just cover all my bases. I synergize with anyone that you want to put in the team. Point blank shot, pretty accurate. The 95% base accuracy has its own crit modifier, plus 50% damage. Has natural synergy with one of my other moves that moves me up to the front at all times, or if someone wants to move themselves back and give me the front spot. So it's pretty cool to duelist advance up to the front, get your repose going, and then crit point blank shot someone for 45 damage and just wipe them out. And then you're just reposting the rest of the fight. And then on the off chance they survive and can knock them back one extra space so he can move back up and shoot someone else in the face the next or two turns later. Grape Shot Blast, actually his worst move, but hold on. Even though it has the minus crit mod and the minus damage, it gives a debuff that makes it so everyone else takes crits received. It didn't need this. It hits three people by default. But sure, let's give him a crit debuff so we can just kill them faster, which makes Grape Shot spamming actually viable. Or if you want to do Grape Shot and Breakthrough and Impale and all those multi-hitting attacks, there you go. It's right there. And it's funny that his worst move is still good. That just adds to the power level of this character. Tracking Shot, for some reason, removes stealth. I mean, it's in the name, Tracking Shot. Can use it from any rank. So in case something goes wrong, if you just have it on randomly, party gets shuffled, he gets thrown to the four slot. You know, let me just Tracking Shot randomly to buff myself for the rest of the battle. Gives me accuracy, crit, and damage. I'll never need anything else. It's like a free set of trinkets or whatever for one move. And he can get by for the rest of the fight with some combination of Duelist Advance, maybe even his Pistol Shot, and then a melee skill. So anytime the fight's gonna go past turn five, definitely Tracking Shot. Then there's Duelist advance which doesn't even have that big of a penalty at the minus 20 and then in turn you get to repose the whole time and as i was saying before it naturally synergizes with point blank shots so turn one you can advance from the second slot up to the front point blank shot and then go back and then duelist advance again or spend a turn using one of his other absurdly powerful moves and it can hit the first three people i want to say this could hit the fourth when they first re uh changed it which would have made it even worse when i say worse i mean more absurd but it's still incredibly good as it is now and it's not even just the fact that a repose does respectable damage and all that. It's one of those things where, since he can use it from almost anywhere, if the team gets screwed up, he can fix his own positioning, or he can help the team fix their positioning by putting himself in a different spot. So if your vessel gets pulled up to rank 2, he can duelist advance, and all of a sudden she's in rank 3, because he's going to be faster than her. And then there's Open Vein. If you have someone else on the team that can bleed, or if you don't want to use Wicked Slice, there's Open Vein, which has a small damage penalty in exchange for doing some really good respectable bleed damage, and also, for some reason, adds a debuff on top of it. What does that debuff do, Shuffle? Well, it actually lowers their bleed resist, which is pretty common for some of the other bleeding moves, but also lowers their speed, for some reason. For some reason! It makes sense with the name, Open Vein, you just slice someone's whatever open, their veins on their arms or legs or whatever, so I understand why they'd slow down, but mechanically, it didn't need that. It already does good damage, he already does good damage, so now you're just lowering speed and synergizing with anyone else that's trying to bleed. So you're just really screwing up the enemies for free with a almost all-in-one move. It's really good. And the biggest reason why the Highwayman occupies the S tier is because he makes every other rogue type almost unimportant. The Grave Robber can get away with being a sniper, and Lunge can crit for some absurd damage, but Outside of the support skills of like the Houndmaster, which there's only a couple that you can even qualify, like his stun is okay, his guard is clutch sometimes, and then his stress heal is actually pretty good. The Highwayman just puts out more damage, doesn't need a dog treat, 
And then also the Houndmaster is less tanky than the Highwayman, so he makes him kind of obsolete. Way better than the Bounty Hunter, I feel like. You don't have to have the setup of marking someone, and then the reliance on RNG critting someone, and your base damage is lower as the Bounty Hunter, so the Highwayman just puts out more damage. It really just trumps the Bounty Hunter in just about every possible way, which is actually why the Caltrops change to the Bounty Hunter was a saving grace, but even then, that's not enough to ever really take him over the Highwayman, I feel. Unless you're specifically trying to go for a mark comp, but that's that's it. That's all the Bounty Hunter has over the Highwayman is marking, which, as we've discussed over this entire video, marking is probably the worst offensive strategy out of, out of the many that exist. You know, if you have your damage over time, I would say marking is better than just raw damage, where you just slap things with no benefit, you know, just flat damage. But otherwise, damage over time is better, heavy control with stuns and movement is better, and marking just falls to this like distant third spot. Well, that's me getting sidetracked. We're talking about the Highwayman and his complete absurdity in this video game. Camp skills just hit one. They're all winners. Gallows humor is still pretty good. It's the same one as the Grave Robber. Are you going to melee build? Unparalleled finesse. Are you even caring about melee? Right? You could just have repost and a bunch of ranged attacks like point blank shot. Still pretty good. Boost your repost. Gives you 10 dodge. Gives you 2 speed. Really good. Clean guns works for point blank shot. So if you just needed to hit even harder with that move, there you go. Pistol. And point blank shot, buffed, grape shot if you actually give a crap, all pretty good. And the only negatives to his camp skills is that they're all actually four points. I didn't think about that until I was reading just now. I went, oh wow, they're all four points. So that is something against him. It is probably one flaw that I could pick out is the fact all his camp skills are four points and two of the four of them only benefit him, but he's your damage dealer. So putting down four points to just give yourself 20% extra damage and a bunch of crit and all that is never bad. It's a good investment. It's better than a lot of the other self damage boosting skills. Like if we consider the, the Hellion, she has a conditional 25% damage boost for three points. She doesn't get any bonus accuracy or bonus crit. The Bounty Hunter has plus 15 accuracy and some damage bonus and it's conditional. It has to be a large enemy. And then we get to Bandit Sense, which is tied for the same one that the Houndmaster has as the best nighttime ambush preventer because you have the uh, surprise chance modifier, which is fantastic. Easily worth four points every single time. All of his trinkets, really good in some form or another. Even the lower level ones, which I don't find myself using too often. The four dodge on the drifter's buckle, pretty good. Trap disarm, always helps. Minus 5% stress heal, no one cares at common level. You know, you're only stress healing like five to eight at a time. It's not a big deal. Plus with how easily he kills things, he's never gonna be stressed out. He's gonna be the one getting all the stress taken off from killing stuff. Flash fire gunpowder, 10% bonus damage for basically nothing. On your range attacks, no one cares about stun resist. He's not really going to get hit too often, but then also stun is one of the least common attack types. There's only a few enemies that have them. By the time you're running into them, like the high level skeletons or the Crimson Court Chevalier, I think he's got the the, the one on the rock with the, the pincers or whatever that does stun and bleed and stuff like that. By the time you're fighting those, you have other trinkets that you're going to be using. So stun not common in the zero to two range. Stalwart Buckle, 5% stress for 5% crit, sign me up, minus virtue, 3%, not that big a deal, who cares? Dodgy Sheath, probably his worst trinket? Minus 10 accuracy for range does kind of hurt, and all you get in return is 8 dodge, which is solid, and then 1 speed, also really good. So if you want to go like a melee heavy build, you can definitely use this. The Sharpening Sheath, really good, but it's coming at a time when you start finding other trinkets, like you're starting to kill bosses that give you orange trinkets that you can use, or you have other universal trinkets that are probably better than this, but if you're going open veins and like repose, this is still really good. One speed is your only trade-off for almost unbeatable bleed chance, unless they're skeletons, and then plus 7% crit out of nowhere. A really fat crit buff, really good. And then there's the gunslinger's buckle, which is definitely better if you're using open veins and repose because those aren't so much about the flat damage they hit for more than the effects that they do. And in return, you just put your range damage and point blank and all that through the roof. So Gunslinger Buckle, really good. Really good to get early, especially. And we have the Crimson Court set. Easily the single best Crimson Court set in the entire game, and it's not even close. The Neckerchief by itself, 2 speed, 10 dodge, very handy. I would use that anytime. 
The shameful locket, 10 accuracy, 5 crit, unconditional, supports both builds on the Highwayman. And you're sitting there, shuffle, wait a minute, 15% stress, that's pretty big, and it's like, yeah, that is kind of big, but also remember, as we said before, this character is the one killing pretty much 2 out of 4 enemies, maybe 3 or 4, who knows? Usually killing about 2 or 3 enemies every single battle by himself. So that 15 stress doesn't come into play that often. Also, stress attacks usually hit the backliners, not so much the frontliners, so it's very negligible. And then, on top of it, you have plus... 45% virtue chance if you have both of them. Your base chance for virtue is 25%. This puts you to 70%. I was about to say 75. This puts you to 70% base virtue bonus, which means you almost have a 2 and 3 chance of going virtuous every single time. And how we were talking before about moves that clash or trinket buffs that clash with each other, like when we were talking about the Crusader, right? This doesn't. Having a bonus 15% stress gain on top of the bonus virtue chance, that actually synergizes with itself. You're pushing him to virtue faster with this setup. So there's no wasted stat on this set. It buffs every single playstyle that he has. And on the off chance there's a bunch of stress going on, he actually has a chance to go virtuous, which is the equivalent of Super Saiyan. This is a trinket set that if you ever find it early, like if you're doing a Blood Moon run and you can actually put it together, depending on the missions, it just puts the Highwayman so far ahead of any other class. It is absurd how strong this set is together. Like I would even go so far as to say, regular Highwayman S tier, Highwayman with Crimson Court set, double S. It would be his own tier of strength and absurdity easily the best damage dealer in the entire game. And as we were saying before with our other criteria, he doesn't need anyone to help him do it. He doesn't have any gimmicks, like he doesn't need Mark, he doesn't need Blight, he doesn't need Bleed, he doesn't need someone to pull them into his range, he can hit wherever he wants most of the time. And then his base stats are godlike, his base damage is higher than most other rogue types and damage dealers in the game, second to only like the couple bruisers that exist. I just cannot get over how well statted and put together this character is in terms of his set and uh, his other trinkets and stuff, it just makes him really good. To the point where, if I had a choice, I would have my various support classes, my various tanks and stuff like that, and then I would have like four Highwaymen. I don't need any other rank 2 character besides Highwaymen. All right, now that I gushed about that set for, I don't know, like five minutes, the crystal trinket, I was gonna say accessory, is pretty good, flat 20 damage, plus three speed, stun resist, we said before is negligible. So this supplements any other build he has. Like there's, for as good as the Crimson Court set is, you can definitely make use out of something like the crystal gunpowder and then like a sun ring or a moon ring if you're, depending on your light level, you know? But it's just good. It just buffs everything he's trying to do, which is just flat damage. And I really can't say enough about this character, it's... The more I talk about it, the more I think about it. In my opinion, this is the best character in the game, by far. Because, as we all like to do things like support, and tank and all that in this game, at the end of the day, you have to kill the monsters. That is the whole point, you have to kill the monsters in the fights to win the game. And the Highwayman is, hands down, the best damage dealer, and the most versatile, so... If you ever need someone to do damage, it's one of those things, it's like the Crusader, where... There are a lot of times where I'm going into a run and I go, you know, instead of the Leper or instead of the Hellion or instead of the Shield Breaker, I wish I had a Crusader right here. Like, a Crusader would be so good right here in this, this moment in time. The same thing happens with the Highwayman. Like, you can almost do any mission in the game without huge risk of failure by having the core of Crusader, Highwayman, and Vestal. They're very simple to play, but they just do so well with their base kits. That's why they're rated so highly, in my opinion. All right, and that's going to do it for our tier list. Appreciate all of you for sticking it out and watching it. it I'm sure it's going to be long. I haven't done any editing yet, obviously, but just the recording alone of audio and takes and stuff like that, it was about five hours worth of me talking, and it took about three days. And I also did, like, background footage and stuff like that, so, again, I appreciate your, your viewership and sticking out, listening to me ramble and talk about stuff like Highwayman's absurd trinkets and Bounty Hunter Caltrops and all that crap. And I will say that right here at the end, I'm gonna change the Bounty Hunter I don't really know exactly where to put him. I mean, it's B tier, but I don't want to have like the left-right paradigm, even though I kind of started heading that way near the end. But I was thinking about the Abomination more over the last day or two, and I used it a few more times too, because I was doing, like I said, background footage. And I think the character is pretty good. It's just that he clashes, or not clashes, but he has that, uh, that situation where he has two different builds and you almost have to play them at the same time to get the most out of the character, but you cannot optimize both builds together. Does that make sense? Where if you keep them in human form, you have the chain and the blight and the self heal, which are all really good, but those are all like range attacks and status. And then he has his transformation attacks, which are all melee, so you can't really 
build stun and blight and all that and survivability because then you're gonna cost yourself with melee skills if you go that way. But also if you go transformation spec the whole time, that puts a lot of stress on him and a little bit extra on the party. And even though he can heal it, you're gonna be spending most of the time in transformation mode, which again, you're losing out on a solid stun, a double blight, a self heal. So what makes him lower is just the fact that you have to use both of his builds and you can't properly optimize either one, I feel like. And also his camping skills aren't that good. But regardless, we're done. Thank you for watching. Let me know what you think below. I'm sure that there are a thousand and one different opinions. I wouldn't be surprised if someone has like this list inverted, to be honest. It'd be a little weird and I'd like to hear the explanation, but I'm sure it's out there. And I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the deep dive, the critical thinking and all that, the analyses, that's always fun. I love Darkest Dungeon, I know a lot of other people do too, so I think this will be a fun discussion to explore and to have. And I'm also gonna start working on some class guides and a Blood Moon guide. And the big reason is because when I did this whole video and I have all these notes, I basically have all the workings for that written out already, so it's just gonna take a bit. I feel like each class guide's gonna be like maybe 10 to 20 minutes, but I'll start working on those soon, TM. It's mainly because I'm trying to do other stuff at the same time. I have other projects and whatever, but this this video itself, this this whole video probably is going to take a whole week in terms of recording and editing to get right, so, whew, a lot of work. Hit the like, comment, and subscribe stuff, and that's not even me trying to front about yeah, it really helps me out, you know, that vague, ambiguous thing. It's really just so I know what to make that people enjoy. Because I go off of when I pick up subs, when I get likes, when I get comments. It's not even for, like, the YouTube algorithms. It's literally just, oh, people want to see this. That's how I treat it. So, yeah. Let me know what y'all think. Have a good one. And I'll see you later.